Hi, my name is Spirit Boshuizen. I'm an equine veterinarian from the Netherlands and I work at the Equine Sport Horse Clinic in Wolvega. Um, I specialize in internal medicine uh, of horses and the KFBS asked me to make a presentation uh, about fall diseases or frequently encountered fall diseases, how to recognize them and how to prevent them. Um, so I try to uh, get back to these risk factors to recognize uh, a disease early uh, as often as possible during this presentation. Um, so we'll go through some main risk factors uh, for diseases in falls right away. Um, then we'll go through like the normal chronological order of the preparation before foaling, um, the foaling itself, what is normal, when do you have to intervene and what can you do to prevent problems and um, uh, what is normal in the neonatal fall. Uh, and then we'll go through some yeah, frequently encountered fall diseases and um, we'll, we'll keep getting back to those uh, risk factors in between to make you really aware of when to intervene and when to call your vet, for instance. Um, in Wolfga we see a lot of neonatal falls. Uh, I really enjoy working with them, uh, but it's always really a big team effort because it's a lot of work to uh, yeah, keep feeding those foals and to keep them happy and alive. So these are, um, I actually made two rows of, uh, of these risk factors that predispose uh, foals to infectious diseases, but also other diseases. W one row on the left about the foals and one on the right about the mares. Um, when we look at the, the row of the foals, uh, there, there are several different things there and we'll keep getting back to them. Uh, one of them, as you might know, is prematurity. If the foal is born too early, um, that gives a real big risk for uh, diseases. Uh, neonatal maladjustment syndrome, or dummy foals. Um, we'll talk about that later as well. Uh, hypothermia, so being too cold. And very important, the failure of passive transfer of uh, immunoglobulins, of antibodies from the colostrum of the mare. Um, delayed time to stand and or nurse. Rejection by the dam uh, sometimes happens, especially for instance after a dystocia or uh, a C-section, and um, poor husbandry. And when we look at the mare side, there are a lot of things that um, are prepartum, so before the foaling, that you should look for. And one of them really important is premature lactation. So when the mare starts lactating um, too early and already loses her colostrum. Um, three things in a row that all well evolve about the same subject are um, the vaginal discharge, premature placental separation or a red bag delivery, um, placentitis, which is a, um, an inflammation of the placenta, a disease of the placenta, uh, prenatal illness of the mare and uh, dystocia, which means um, problems during foaling. Uh, the foaling doesn't uh, continue as normal perhaps because the foal is uh, positioned uh, in the wrong way or is too big. There's um, yeah, a too slow and difficult foaling. And also poor nutrition and husbandry. So we want to prevent the foal on the left with colic and diseases. Um, we want a happy foal. Uh, and how are we going to do that? So preparation before foaling is really important to prevent a lot of problems. Um, it's really important to have your mare in the foaling stall already around six weeks before foaling. Uh, you want her to have time to adjust uh, all her antibody production that's going to be delivered to the foal in the colostrum to the location where she is when she falls, where the, where the foal is growing up. And she needs a little bit of time for that. Also, uh, all the stress of uh, moving to a different location um, is of course better if it's a bit more early before the for the foaling uh, than really close to it. So make sure there's a really clean, nice bedded straw uh, stall. Um, just also have the picture on the right to prevent problems with the foal uh, with pressure sores. So vaccination of the mare, uh, we recommend to uh, revaccinate her um, around six weeks before foaling to deworm her. And not just a tetanus and influenza vaccination, but well, very um, uh, at the moment, a very hot item, uh, uh, the EHV1 and 4 vaccinations, the um, rhinopneumoniae. Uh, don't forget to vaccinate your mares at five, seven and nine months. There's a lot of EHV every year going around in both Netherlands and other countries uh, around the world. And it's something we can prevent an abortion from um, EHV. So don't forget to vaccinate all your mares for fi at five, seven and nine months. Um, 
when uh, the mare had a Catholic uh, surgery, then she needs to be opened. Sutures need to be removed around two weeks before the uh, foaling or the anticipated foaling date. I really um, would uh, uh, encourage everyone to wash and clean their mares um, a few weeks before the uh, foaling already. So wash their hindquarters, the tail, the other. Uh, and if there's a lot of feces on these legs and on her other, Foal will get the um, feces in his mouth before drinking colostrum, which is not a good idea. So clean your clean your mare. Just have a nice and clean uh, foaling stall. And another really important thing is to check um, the other developments uh, for premature lactation. So if the mare starts lactating, for instance, more than a week before the anticipated date, and like in this picture, really is leaking all her colostrum, then you know that she's losing colostrum, which is then not available for the fall. So you'll have time to prepare and find another source. Um, and it's also sometimes a sign, especially when it's a really early uh, other development, that there might be something wrong with your mare, that she needs a checkup from the vet. She could be developing placentitis, for instance. So that's a real um, alarm bell. So, yeah. When um, looking back at our row of uh, risk factors and poor husbandry, so ha not having a clean stable and not having everything arranged on time for your mare in fall is a big risk factor for neonatal infectious diseases. Um, and of course, the premature lactation that we talked about uh, as well. So how long would uh, a normal gestation period of a mare be? Um, th there's a lot of variation. So uh, it could be anywhere from 330 days until a full year, and sometimes even longer than that. Um, on average, around 340 days. But every mare sort of has her own normal gestation uh, time. Uh, so if your mare has had falls before, I would always recommend to uh, write down how many days uh, she has um, carried her falls so that you know better in advance when to uh, look more closely at your mare. Um, that could be changed of course, uh, the normal gestation time if you've had 10 falls all at 340 days. If she would start uh, way too early it could be due to sickness of the mare, um, just then always look for the vaginal discharge or premature lactation. Um, sometimes when mares uh, are falling quite early in the year, so late winter, right about now for instance, uh, beginning of spring, it could be that she uh, she's carrying a bit longer, so around 5 to 10 days longer than um, and the average um, later fall. Prematurity, that's um, when the fall is born before 320 days. But of course we know now know that there's a really big variation and some mares would normally carry almost a year. So if a mare that normally carries a year has a fall around 330 days, it could be that it's also um, not mature enough. We would call it perhaps then dismature. Um, it means that it has had a normal length of uh, gestation, but um, that the fall still doesn't look mature. And you could uh, recognize it, the, the picture below here, uh, the fall is very small, uh, it's thin, not a lot, of, a lot of muscle on it. It's very silky hair, uh, flaccid ears and mouth. It's weak and sometimes unable to stand or nurse. And um, ossification problems uh, are, yeah, with the premature falls, uh, sometimes a big problem. As you can see here, this is an x-ray of an, a premature fall. And this is um, the tarsus. Here, the bones haven't really fully developed yet. There's not a lot of bone here as you would normally have. And when the fall starts walking on these premature um, legs, it can get crooked legs and problems, pain, lameness, etc. And this dismaturity could easily be caused, uh, for instance, when there's de developmental problems during the pregnancy. Um, for instance, in this picture you can see a thickened and, well, icky looking uh, placenta um, with a placentitis. So when there's placentitis, the foal doesn't get all the feed and all the oxygen it needs, and you get problems uh, with dismaturity, but also sometimes with dummy foals. And this picture shows a dismature foal very small compared to the mare. So prematurity, if, you're f if you know you how long your mare is going to carry her foal, very handy. If it's her first foal, um, you know now how long it should carry. And if it's premature, that's really a red flag. If you have a premature foal, be sure to uh, let your vet assess it uh, within 24 hours and be sure that, for instance, the ossification is normal, but also um, that this foal is getting enough um, colostrum. 
Um, when we know that there's uh, problems with your mare with vaginal discharge or uh, placentitis, uh, these things can be diagnosed prepartum uh, with an ultrasound of the um, a rectal ultrasound, um, and the mare can be treated for this. So, if there's, for instance, premature lactation or vaginal discharge, you need to uh, alert your vet and have the mare assessed because then uh, we already know that we may be able to do something for her um, to save your fall. And uh, we also know that when the foal is born, it needs special attention. It needs blood work, it needs uh, checkups more frequently than a normal foal would. So normal foaling, um, uh, what is normal? Um, there's quite a lot of variation, especially in stage one, the preparation phase of um, uh, the foaling process could be quite short from 30 minutes to several hours. It looks like a sort of a colic, um, a little bit of restlessness, walking up and down, lying down. Um, it's a uterine contractions uh, that start that um, start the foaling and that give the mare sort of the, the colics. Um, it lasts until the water breaks, the Coriolantuis, when it ruptures, um, the water breaks and then, you know, she's going into the actual birth of the foal. So in stage one, it would be wise, I've underlined the things that you should do as an owner, to bandage the tail and to clean her and to dry the hindquarters after cleaning so that the foal will enter sort of a clean world. Um, at the actual birth, um, we see active abdominal contractions in lateral position. This is actually the water bladder, just before it breaks. When the mare goes into lateral position and starts having active abdominal contractions, things should move really fast. Um, the fall turns into the birth canal, and after about 5 to 20 minutes after that the water has broken, you should see this amniotic sac with the uh, two front feet and a nose. And um, mare will have about 20 minutes of contractions and that should be it, then the fall should be out. Um, this, uh, the amnion, uh, the, the white uh, thing around, the, the white bag around the fall, it should tear when sort of the shoulders are out of the mare. It's, if it's not torn, you need to tear it. Here you can see it's torn, fall is out, so his, his legs are still in the mare, that's totally fine. You can leave them like this when the foal is able to breathe uh, for well, most of the time they'll, they'll rest for about 15 to 20 minutes um, and that's, uh, that's a good thing to just let happen. Don't pull out the foal immediately, just let them be like this. Stage three, um, not to forget uh, the passage of the fetal membranes of the placenta um, that can take a normal time would be somewhere between 30 minutes and two hours, it can be a bit longer. If it's really fast, if the placenta immediately follows the fall, for instance, that sometimes can happen, or I don't know, five or ten minutes later, uh, then the fall comes out, that's also a really big red flag because that is a big risk factor for uh, neonatal maladjustment syndrome or dummy falls because the fall um, might have hypoxia. If the placenta follows really quickly, you know should have had oxygen through that placenta that it will not um, have had oxygen during birth. So it was not able to breathe because it was still in the mare, but there was also no oxygen supply through the placenta anymore. So it's really important. If you see it come out super fast, um, you have to alert your vet this fall will develop problems probably. Um, if the placenta hangs out, just tie it up. That's something to do. That's why it's underlined here. And um, so she, she doesn't step on it and tear it apart. And check when it's completely out for completeness and size. So during foaling, when to intervene? If there's no progression. Uh, stage one, it should not last longer than four hours. Um, and if you do not see a water bladder that ruptures um, and she doesn't go into stage two, then you know uh, there's a problem and you should call your vet, he'll probably ask you to have a feel and try to see if there's uh, two front feet and a nose. If stage two takes more than half an hour uh, or, or if you see no progression at all, and stage two, just to remind you, is the phase with abdominal contractions, then you really uh, should intervene and call your vet. Uh, he'll also ask, are there two front feet and is there a nose, what's going on? Um, and other red flags are a red bag delivery, that's the picture down below here. Instead of a white bladder top, that should, that's the normal look. If you see a red velvety bag come out of the, uh, uh, the vulva of the mare, that's called a red bag delivery and it means that the placenta is coming first, the placenta previa. Um, and if the placenta comes first, that's uh, hypoxia for the fall because the placenta has detached itself from the uterus, there's no 
oxygen uh, um, exchange anymore, so the fall is suffocating. When you see this, you have to immediately intervene. You cannot just call your vet first and wait for him. You cut it open and you pull out the fall as quickly as you can and then call your vet in the meantime. Um, if the foal is in a wrong position, that would also be, uh, if there's no tr two front feet, no nose, then you should definitely call your vet uh, to help. Also, a reason to call the vet is if there's meconium, uh, the feces of the foal uh, in the uterus, in the amniotic fluids, or on the foal, when you've taken it out, and or when it has been born, um, that's a big risk factor for pneumonia, which we we'll talk about later. Also, if there's no normal regular breathing within one minute, um, then you have to intervene, clear the airways, just try to rub the nose clean, rub the foal with a, a towel, a tactile stimulation to get its breathing and perhaps even dip it in cold water so it's, uh, it sort of awakens. And again, the placenta that comes out too fast, which we talked about, also a red flag. So when the foal is out with its chest and the nose is free, it's breathing normally, it's going to wrestle itself into sort of a sternal position, it's upright, then you can just leave the mare and fall alone. Um, that would be nice if they would just stay attached with the umbilicus for about 20 to 30 minutes. Um, because then there's still some blood exchange from the placenta into the foal. And that would be handy for him. So normally an umbilicus would break by itself, but if not, I, uh, I call this the Christmas cracker technique. Uh, that's probably not a really good description, but I've put a picture here. Um, do not cut or uh, use scissors or whatever. Don't sharply uh, try to get the umbilicus um, ruptured. You just use two hands, one on the fall side, one on the mare side, um, and um, you gently pull them apart. And around 10 centimeter from the navel or, or from the umbilicus, um, you can feel a little bit of a more dense area and you just pull them apart like this. So you fixate on the belly and on the other side and you pull them apart. So no no cutting. Also no ropes, no shoelaces or kitchen rope. Uh, we see all sorts of things that people uh, in panic bind around their uh, uh, foals umbilicus. Um, just if you get a foal this year, just get yourself some of these navel clamps um, that are also used for babies and just buy them at the, um, an, um, yeah, at the doctor's office probably. So if uh, things are not going well and you have to go, for instance, to um, uh, a hospital to get the foal out, then generally we would try to reposition and extract the foal first without anesthesia, of course. But if it doesn't work under general anesthesia, this is uh, an attempt to do that. But you can see Mare is already being um, uh, shaved for a C-section because that is likely going to happen after that if that doesn't work. Um, C-sections... Uh, they're not that common, uh, not as common as in cows, but um, we see around, I think, 10 to 15 mares each year that we have to do a C-section on. And it's a really big team effort, as you can imagine, because there's not one patient, but two. Um, this is a mare um, from Piet Sipma from last year. And he, as you can see, uh, as the owner and the rest of the team, Waling, my colleague. Um, and um, yeah, there's people needing to take care of the foal. The foal is being born under anesthesia. Uh, it needs to recover from that anesthesia and as you can imagine this whole process is very dangerous for the foal um, because it can have hypoxia um, during the dystocia, it can have hypoxia because of the general anesthesia of the mare and because it's being born under anesthesia as you can see here. Um, this is the foal from Pete from last year and it's doing great. Um, it's a uh, um, a really fast process and if the foal does not breathe and this is also a resuscitation protocol that people use when it, there's not a c-section but when a foal is being born for instance with a, um, a heavy extraction and it's not breathing there's like really strict lines if there's uh, uh, is there breathing uh, yes or no if there's uh, no breathing evaluate heart rate and then we go through these schemes and um, uh, you try to uh, breathe the foals with oxygen give them heart massage and if eventually drugs if they do not uh, respond. Um, a prognosis from a, a cesarean section fall really depends on how long uh, the mare has already been in uh, foaling. Um, with Frisians we more frequently see transverse positions and that's actually good for the fall uh, because it's not being pushed on a lot in the birth canal yet because it's positioned with its back against well, the back door of the mare. 
Um, so yeah, that actually really gives them a better prognosis than uh, uh, like a, a warm blood, for instance. So when uh, with with a difficult birth, uh, these are the things that we really have. Uh, and we've already assessed these are risk factors for neonatal infectious diseases, so neonatal maladjustment syndrome or dummies. Um, that's something that happens more often after a C-section than not. Uh, rejection by the dam is uh, by the mare is something um, that sometimes happens after a C-section, for instance, because she was full was born under anesthesia of the mare, she doesn't know it, and sometimes they reject it. And that's, of course, a big danger for the foal because it will not get a normal youth the first, uh, the first days, at least. Um, premature placental separations, the red bag deliveries, but also the dystocias, all big red flags for foals to develop problems. So here are some guidelines, um, probably uh, most people will already know, uh, for the neonatal viability. So what what is normal? And um, well, you can of course look back in these uh, slides uh, and I don't know, print them out and put them next to your stable if you're having a fall for the first time, that would be a good idea, just to know what is normal. Uh, the, the most important one that I want to emphasize is nursing from the other. How fast is the fall drinking? It should really drink within two hours, I think. And um, if it's then still not drinking, we should definitely try to help it. Um, yeah, and if foal does not listen to these rules and it's not working like that, then do alert your vet, uh, and you have to intervene. And the quicker you intervene, the less, yeah, the less bigger problems uh, you get afterwards. So if a foal does not nurse in time, one of the things that also happens is hypothermia. So it will get cold, and therefore it will be even more depressed and more uh, or less likely to stand and nurse. So it gets into a like a downward spiral uh, of negative, um, yeah, a quick way to dying actually. Um, failure of passive transfer, because it's not standing up and drinking, um, it will not get enough colostrum. Uh, and yeah, rejection by the dams of course will lead to um, delayed time to, to nurse uh, and failure of passive transfer if you do not intervene and give the foal the opportunity to drink and to drink colostrum. So why is uh, colostrum so important? We I've already said it tw uh, t uh, 10 times the word. Um, why is it so important? Because a foal is born without antibodies, without a defense against pathogens. And why is it born without antibodies? Because the placenta of a horse is a really intricate one, it is uh, the most complete one that exists uh, among mammals. It has six layers, uh, three of the foal and three of the mare. So it's super complete and therefore uh, the, the stuff that can pass is oxygen, carbon dioxide, glucose, uh, urea and creatinine. Um, it's like the waste products of the foal. Well, what cannot pass are the immunoglobulins, the antibodies for the foal, so it's defense. And also red blood cells cannot pass. So it has to get those um, uh, antibodies from drinking colostrum. Um, immunoglobulin G and A are the most important ones that are in there. And um, that's just the way for a foal to get his defense against pathogens. And if he doesn't get it, there's lots of problems, problems uh, to expect. There's one condition in which a foal may not drink uh, colostrum, and that's neonatal isoerythrolysis or rhesus. That's what we actually what we call in in Dutch sometimes, um, and it's a disease which leads to immune mediated an anemia. So red blood cell destruction by the maternal antibodies from the colostrum, and that's when the mare has made antibodies against the blood type of the foal, the red blood cell type, and these are the four most common ones um, why uh, against which a mare will produce the antibodies. Um, she will produce antibodies if there has been, for instance, contact between her blood and the foal's blood uh, at placenta level during late pregnancy, for instance, but also, for instance, during uh, foal birth from the years before. So it's mainly mares that have uh, had multiple foals that will develop antibodies against the um, blood type of the foal. Um, it's quite common, actually. It's around 2% of foals that d that have um, neonatal isoerythrolysis. Uh, so it's a, quite a common disease. Um, they get really yellow, yellow like, a, like really yellow. And that's because of the uh, breakdown problem, uh, the breakdown products of the erythrocytes. And they turn the um, eyes yellow, the nose yellow. 
If you take blood from these foals, you can actually really see what's going on. This is a normal blood um, from, a, from a, an adult horse, actually. And this is the blood from a foal with neonatal isoerythrolysis. You can see it's really red. That's because of the breakdown of the erythrocytes. Um, in the erythrocytes, there's hemoglobin and um, that turns the blood, uh, the plasma, uh, like orangey uh, red. Um, and also urine really turns into a dark brown coffee-like color. So that's something to pay attention to um, with your foals. If you see it urinate, always look, is it uh, nice and um, almost watery in color or is it like this? Um, if you know your mare has had uh, a neonatal erythrolysis fall before, or for instance, when she has had herself uh, blood transfusions in the past, then she's also been in contact with strange blood. Um, then you should check your mare's blood uh, for these antibodies. And you can do that in sort of the last month of her pregnancy. And we'll send away the blood and uh, check it for these antibodies. And if they are present, then for sure you know that this foal that is being born um, is at danger for developing this. And we will not, we would typically not give it uh, the colostrum of herself, of your own mare, but from another mare and um, milk this mare and discard her colostrum. So why do we need it on time? Because the intestinal barrier of the foal uh, only can absorb this, uh, these antibodies for about a day. And also because um, if the foal is just rummaging around its stable and licking the mare and licking the walls that you of course have cleaned very hygienically uh, up front, but it will get all sorts of pathogens in its mouth before it drinks colostrum and has a defense. So it needs, it needs colostrum quickly. 85% of the antibodies that they absorb are in the first 12 hours of their life. And after that, it gets rapidly less. Um, uh, it, it takes about 24 hours and then the gut really starts to close and more antibody absorption is not possible anymore. So it needs to drink directly and quickly. Um, around two liters of colostrum in the first eight hours would be ideal, but of course you have no idea how much your foal is drinking. Um, what would be normal in red here? Uh, around six to seven times per hour getting up and drinking, and about one to two minutes uh, every time in one go. If you have a foal without a mare, uh, perhaps uh, because the mare has died or she doesn't have good quality colostrum, then you would give it around 500 mils of good quality colostrum every two hours, for instance, by bottle. If this doesn't work and something has gone wrong, that happens sometimes, or actually quite often, this is a uh, common disease, a failure of passive transfer happens. And then the immunoglobulins, so the defense that he should have absorbed, he does not absorb, and there are big problems to expect. So why could that happen? Um, for instance, if you have a foal with um, the inability to walk and stand, if it has really crooked legs, for instance, oh. um, that would be uh, very difficult to get to the other and drink on time. Um, if it's sick or weak because of an intrauterine infection, because the mare perhaps had a placentitis, uh, it had a very difficult uh, birth and therefore um, aspirated its own meconium, for instance. These are all things that could lead to a weakness and um, not enough colostrum uptake. Uh, premature lactation, when the mare has lost all her good quality colostrum already and uh, is already giving normal milk would be a reason um, for failure of passive transfer as well. Um, some mares just do not milk up good uh, and have um, quite a bad quality of colostrum, for instance, when they're really aged or have uh, Cushing's disease or PPID. Death of the mare, of course, or uh, rejection of the mare would also lead to uh, not enough um, antibodies absorption uh, because it will just not be able to drink. So a lot of things um, uh, of the risk factor list we uh, have passed by, the hypothermia, uh, failure of passive transfer, delayed time to stand and or nurse, and rejection by the dam. All big risk factors to um, a neonatal infectious diseases because they sort of all lead to failure of passive transfer. Um, especially when there's also no colostrum available at all because the mare has lost it. So there's no defense against pathogens then. Infections, of course, then uh, are a lot more likely, but also energy shortage. If it doesn't drink, it doesn't get any glucose and it will not have enough energy to walk around. It will get hypothermia. It also will get dehydrated really fast. 
And often encountered diseases are um, sepsis, uh, arthritis in relation to sepsis, diarrhea, pneumonia, umbilical infections. That's about your top five of infectious diseases that they will develop. Um, another thing that's not infectious but does relate to failure of passive transfer uh, is meconium obstipation. So falls that do not drink enough colostrum. Um, quickly also develop meconium obstipation because this colostrum has a real laxative effect. And uh, meconium is a really thick uh, uh, feces um, it, it needs to be laxated out. Uh, and also filling of the stomach will trigger a reflex in the gut of the fall to actually move and get all this uh, meconium out. So when I see a fall with meconium obstipation in the clinic, we always really check for IgG levels um, to see if it doesn't have failure of passive transfer. So a big uh, easy thing for prevention of disease is to check whether your fall has had enough uh, colostrum and just check the level in the blood um, around a day age. If it's too low and it's still like younger than 18 hours, you could try to give it a uh, good quality colostrum uh, via a bottle or via tubing. Um, if it's already older than that, I would actually not really bother to try it that way, but um, would immediately go for a plasma transfusion. Um, here you can see three of our lovely blood donors. We have, um, um, I think at the moment, around eight or nine blood, blood donors at the clinic. Um, these are our own horses and they're spoiled, but they have to give blood once a month um, to help all these little sick neonates um, because um, uh, we, yeah, we use their plasma um, as a source of immunoglobulins for foals that do not have enough and would die otherwise. So big thank you to all these horses. Um, when you need to feed your uh, foal by bottle, because it's not able to drink from the mare or the mare doesn't have milk, be sure to do it the right way. And if possible, you can uh, try to um, get your foal acquainted to drinking from um, like a little tub, because then it will not um, uh, get milk into its trachea. Eh, to, uh, uh, it will not as easily have dysphagia when feeding with a bottle. Um, feeding with a bottle, if you lift it up too high, um, you can easily pour it into the uh, airways of the fall and it will get a pneumonia. Um, so bottle feeding method is tugging the fall underneath your armpit um, so it will feel like another uh, and like the corner of the leg and the belly of a mare um, and not putting the bottle up right but just keep it like that so you have less chance of feeding its airways instead of its gut. And if you have to um, uh, bottle feed a fall do it around the other if the mare is still present because if you are near the other uh, every time it feeds it will if it's later on able to feed uh, and nurse by itself it will e more easily feed on the mare than when you have been feeding it at the door all the time so recognizing disease is really important and to recognize it um, uh, as early on as possible so we'll go through uh, a few pictures and a few different diseases to see how um, yeah, how these things can be recognized. So depression, this is a really, really clear uh, example, of course, of a very uh, depressed fall. Um, but my point is actually to be aware that falls that are sleeping while standing, that's not normal. Uh, then it, that has to be a red flag. So if a foal is standing, it should either drink, run around, uh, interact with the mare, but not uh, stand like this uh, um, or sleep in inappropriate positions and inappropriate positions, of course, standing, but also sleeping in sternal recumbency uh, with upright, with its head uh, upright for in, a ver in a vertical position, um, would also trigger us to have an extra look at a fall. They should just lay flat out lateral position and that would be normal. If they're not nursing, um, how do you know if a fall is not nursing? Well, the first thing you probably notice is that the udder of the mare is full, distended, painful, um, because that's yeah, the mare will get uh, annoyed if you touch it. Uh, but things that you can uh, uh, find with the fall uh, are depression, of course, that we saw in the first clip, but also deep lying eyes or even curled in eyelids. In this fall, I was uh, severely ill, but the uh, eyelids were curled inwards temporarily because of dehydration and, and other problems and we so we stitch them out so that it doesn't get corneal ulcers. That's just a temporary solution and that will get normal when the fall is um, rehydrated. Uh, things you can notice uh, of your fall as well are cold extremities, so the ears, the nose, the legs, they will feel cold. So 
whenever you th see anything like this, just take the temperature of the fall and it should be anywhere between 37.5 and 38.7. And most people only look for fever, but also look for hypothermia because uh, a fall with 36 or 35 degrees is really, really sick. And that should trigger um, you calling the vet, of course. Um, one of the most frequent causes of disease and death in falls is actually neonatal sepsis. And neonatal sepsis is a response of the body to microorganisms such as bacteria and their toxins and products. And it's the response of the body, um, which we call a systemic inflammatory response syndrome or SIRS, um, which can lead in the end to even multi-organ failure. Um, it's a really common uh, disease in falls and Often when they are admitted and treated as early as possible, um, we can uh, cure them. Uh, but a very annoying thing of falls is that they can then survive this primary infection. Uh, but there's always a big risk of later on, a few days later, sometimes even a week later, that they still will succumb to complications that have great grave prof prognosis, prognosis for the long term. For instance, um, a polyarthritis, if they have multiple joints that are infected, that need flushing, um, uh, surgery, um, all these things. Uh, that's a really big risk with neonatal sepsis. So we can... Uh, often get them to survive primary infection, but the prognosis is not very good uh, uh, for falls with sepsis because they develop a lot of complications. And a lot of risk factors uh, are involved in this disease, before, during and after falling. Uh, these infections, they can be uh, local or generalized. They can uh, enter the body through the placenta already before falling, uh, looking at mares with vaginal discharge or placentitis or EHV. Um, they can uh, enter the body through the lungs, uh, for instance, with meconium aspiration uh, during birth, um, through the intestinal tract, uh, rummaging through your dirty stable uh, before having had their colostrum, can uh, also uh, very often enter the body through the umbilicus. So umbilical care is really important in falls. Pressure source, which we talked about earlier, having a nice stable. Um, also, of course, an open connection to the world outside. Bacteria can go in and they can uh, um, go through the bloodstream and well, cause sepsis. And uh, things that you should always monitor in your falls are the umbilicus, of course. So here we see an umbilical infection and an abscess, two different versions of it. Um, and here we see also a risk factor. It's a fall that is urinating also through its umbilicus. Uh, it's leaking urine, urine actually. Uh, so you know there's an open, um, way into the body, into the urine, uh, into the bladder, and we call that a patent urachus. Um, this would be the, the way a fall would urinate during um, life in utero, uh, but that should close uh, right after, the, after birth, and if it doesn't close or even opens up again, for instance, when they have an infection here, um, yeah, then it's an, an open connection to the world outside and an easy way in for bacteria, and this is a uh, um, a surgically removed urachus with a lot of pus in it. So umbilical disinfection, very important. Um, we would recommend to use chlorhexidine uh, a solution in alcohol. But you can also use iodine, uh, for instance. If it's bleeding, use the clamp. Uh, do not use a straw rope from the stable that you found in panic. Um, so this is what I just talked about, uh, recognizing disease at joint level, the, the septic arthritis falls. So they've been septic or they had a um, uh, infection in their umbilicus and sometimes you see it really easily, but sometimes it's also really not that um, obvious and the infected joint is the first thing that you will see. So how do you recognize problems here? It's, well, look at the symmetry between, for instance, this knee and here. This is a swollen uh, joint, this knee as well. Mostly this happens in the big joints, uh, the, the knees, uh, tarsi. Um, and it's a, it's a bacterial inflammation and infection uh, in the joints, often um, yeah, uh, traveled into the joint through the bloodstream. Um, you can recognize it by distended swollen joints, a fever very often and lameness. And the prognosis, yeah, it's a little bit guarded um, for uh, what I said here earlier. Um, 
it all depends on how fast are you in treating them, in, in, in recognizing it and treating them. So the earlier and the more aggressive the treatment of these problems, the better the prognosis. So when you have a distended joint or possibly a lame fall, immediately get the vet out and get it checked. Because if you wait another day or another two days, all the cartilage inside this whole joint is a lot more difficult to get better um, than when you treat it right away. Um, this sepsis, uh, if it spreads through the body, um, and these bacteria sometimes can also trigger uh, uveitis. So always also look at the eyes of the foals. Uh, uveitis is a, like an inflammation of the iris of the horse, uh, and the foal, foals frequently get like quite yellow eyes. If you see that, make sure you check for sepsis and, and be sure that it is checked for sepsis. Um, the treatment mainly consists of antibiotics, anti-inflammatories uh, and surgical flushing of the joints that are affected. So getting all the, all the debris out of the, um, uh, of the joints and flushing them clean, get as most as the bacteria out uh, surgically as possible. And as you can see, this entire uh, table is now red because all these things um, uh, make uh, the risk for sepsis bigger. So disease number one in falls. This is just a, a little bit of um, a summary of, of uh, the most important things. So recognize your fall at risk because we know um, now what to look for when is a fall at risk for passive transfer. And this is the, the level that uh, he should actually get, at least 800 mg per deal. Um, and a placental issue. So uh, if we know that the mare has had a placentitis during her um, pregnancy or when you, we know that a foal was born with a red bag delivery when the placenta came first um, or when the placenta follows the foal too quickly, so within 30 minutes of falling, we know it's a hypoxia risk and that it might develop uh, dummy syndrome or neonatal maladjustment syndrome. Um, and we, yeah, we want uh, your vet to come out as soon as possible and look at this fall. Prematurity, also a big risk factor for sepsis. Heavy labor, uh, when the, um, the foal gets meconium in its mouth um, or when the mare was sick during uh, her pregnancy. And speed is of the essence, so very important. You don't want to end up with a fall like this, you want to prevent this. So reducing the risk, um, just make sure you have a clean foaling stall, uh, disinfect your foaling stalls between mares, if you use the same stall for instance, um, and just make sure it's nice and clean and hygienic, especially her other, uh, her hindquarters and her tail, just wash them nicely with soap um, uh, before the fall nurses for the first time, make sure it's just clean there. Very important, I think, is when people try to encourage the foals to nurse to have clean hands. So either wear gloves or wash your hands, uh, but do not stick your dirty hands in his mouth all the time to try and get him to drink. That's really important. You need to wash your hands. And I think everyone now with COVID is a little bit more aware of how things are being uh, spread, how diseases are being spread. So I hope that helps also for the foals. So assure that you have good quality colostrum and I've added some things here because how do you know that the mare is having uh, a good quality colostrum? Um, you can just look at it and see that it's not, it doesn't look like cow milk yet. It's not uh, white, but it's nice, uh, thick and yellow. Um, and that that's what nice colostrum and good quality colostrum should look like. But you can also do some tests. You can buy yourself a Brix uh, refractometer, small uh, small apparatus um, that you can measure levels um, of um, yeah IgG actually with so it's more fat levels actually but um, uh, here you have some guidelines and when this would be good this this is the uh, screen that you see if you look through a Brix meter and you just know okay this is a mare above 22 I'm really happy below we know this is poor quality colostrum and she will not have good colostrum for the fall. Um, then make, just make sure that it gets into the fall as well. And you can test and see if it has had enough uh, immunoglobulins. So the umbilical care, we would say twice a day for two to three days. Um, but if something is wrong with the umbilicus and, and it, uh, it needs treatment, um, and then it probably is a longer time. And you need to uh, check it, but also dip it. Dip it with chlorhexidine, for instance. And also with this part, with umbilical care, just be sure to have clean hands and not infect the uh, umbilicus with your hands. Just just be uh, hygienic. 
So recognizing uh, some other uh, abnormal behaviors, I think this is a really important one as well. It's quite frequently encountered a disease. It's not an infectious disease, but it's a neonatal maladjustment syndrome. Um, it's a syndrome, so that also always means that there's different theories about how it uh, um, happens and probably there are different ways of how this, this disease um, uh, develops in a fall. But it's a damage to, to the organs caused by hypoxia during falling that will lead to uh, problems in the brain, uh, but also, for instance, it can lead to uh, hypoxic gut, um, which would lead to necrotizing enterocolitis, um, but it can also even give kidney necrosis. So most people think just about the, the abnormal behavior that a dummy fall has and then think it's just a, a, ne a, a neurological disease, but it can be far worse. And uh, hypoxia, uh, the shortage of oxygen, um, it can be caused by uh, dystocias, uh, but also by placentitis, uh, chronic hypoxia. Um, red bag delivery is a really, really classic one, uh, which can cause hypoxia and then lead to neonatal maladjustment syndrome. Um, a C-section fall as well. So these neurological symptoms usually are transient. Um, they start often but before the fall is 24 hours it can be born normal and then later develop these symptoms um, it depends a bit there are different forms but sometimes uh, falls uh, develop these neurological uh, normal behaviors uh, only after or just after like three or four days even so um, there's a big variation in how it develops but the abnormal behavior that you will see is inappropriate suckle reflex so it will try to drink from the wall instead of from the mare um, it can be um, uh, intermittently depressed until even like comatose or uh, seizuring and with seizuring i mean like epileptic seizures um, so there's a big variation in how bad these falls can be from a little bit depressed to very very uh, very sick uh, they will probably not recognize the mare or um, yeah produce even abnormal vocalizations. Uh, Barkers is another name that they would get uh, earlier. Uh, these foals, they do not feed uh, because they do not recognize the mare and they don't know where to drink, so they are at risk for sepsis as well. And this is a new theory actually, or new, it's a few years old, about how um, these dummies also uh, how it how it happens, how it develops, and it's called postnatal persistence of fetal inhibition, which actually means when the fall is in the uterus, it is sort of asleep uh, because that's handy; it's not kicking around all the time, and that's a form of intrauterine consciousness, and it's caused by hormones that the fall has in its blood, adenosinus, all these different progesterone metabolites, and also because of the warmth and the the uh, buoyancy inside the uterus in the in the fluids and during birth the pressure of the mare her pelvis on the chest of the foal triggers the foal's brain to release stimulating hormones such as estradiol and noradrenaline um, that's like the normal process during birth and these um, in in addition to these hormones the sensory input of coming into the new world into the cold um, input uh, via sight it suddenly sees things it hears things the mare is licking it so it has all sorts of sensory input it should awaken uh, the foal's brain to be a normal foal and um, this sometimes doesn't happen uh, normally and probably there's a link between the two uh, these two uh, theories of how uh, neonatal maladjustment syndrome happens because hypoxia increases the hi inhibiting substances in the foal's blood as well. So it would be more intrauterine unconscious um, in um, this situation. So this is uh, what it would look like if it's really bad, it's not breathing by its own, it needs, uh, um, it's actually needs breathing to stay alive. Um, this is a fall that needed a blood transfusion because it had neonatal isoerythrolysis, which can also lead to hypoxia. And this is a fall that really uh, represents how they are asleep and it doesn't look normal how it's sleeping because it's got tucked up front legs. They should lie nicely and uh, stretched. Um, well, as you can see, if we just are able to keep it alive, the f uh, um, and, and wait until its brain starts to work again normally. Um, it's just afterwards, it has actually quite a good prognosis to be a happy and normal fall. 
Uh, these are, of course, all things that are related to hypoxia um, f before the uh, foaling, but also during foaling with C-sections, induced parturitions. Also advanced maternal age, if the mare is old, have a little bit more chance to uh, develop a neonatal maladjustment syndrome fall. Uh, and twins, um, they have to share their placenta and share the oxygen supply and the food supply from the mare, so they will also be at more risk if they are born alive to be a dummy. So because of the, um, uh, all the theories there, the, the hormone theories about the pressure on the chest, um, John Madigan uh, and Monica Illman have developed a Madigan full squeeze method to sort of mimic the, um, the birth and try to um, get the fall to increase its stimulating in, uh, substances and to, be, to awaken again. So it's a sort of an uh, additional therapy for falls with neonatal maladjustment syndrome. Um, and I think a lot of breeders know about this, but uh, I just wanted to add it to the presentation because it's not a miracle therapy. Uh, as, uh, as I explained, if the foal has had severe hypoxia, it can have all sorts of problems from into seizuring and uh, kidney failure, etc. So there's a very big scala of foals that have that are a dummy and I think um, definitely that this can have its place in uh, therapy of these falls but um, especially for um, falls that are just mimic uh, just having a little bit of strange behavior but further are okay uh, then I would definitely try it especially in falls that are young and have, have developed this disease but they shouldn't have rib fractures or dyspnea or sepsis when you do this um, because uh, that would actually um, yeah, give us a risk for a perforation of the um, lungs with the, wrist, with the ribs if we put these ropes around him. So we mimic the squeeze of the fall actually uh, of the mare, her pelvis, um, uh, when it, the fall would be born. Uh, there's a rope being tied. This is John Madigan putting on the ropes and showing us how that works. You can find that online if you want to. Um, and you apply these uh, ropes in this way and if you then put pressure on it, the fall will lie down. It's Probably most people will recognize this because when you have a fall that's really young, a few days old, and you keep it very tight because you have to uh, give it something or check something, it will um, uh, go through its legs and it will try to lie down. Um, that's because of the pressure that you put on him. And uh, the idea is to put this pressure on for about 20 minutes, the fall will lie down. It will also make it easier, for instance, to give it plasma or uh, do stuff with it because it's sort of asleep. Um, you put this pressure 20 minutes on and then you release it. And some foals will then get up and drink. Um, and that's, of course, fantastic. So we use it um, in addition to a lot of other things that we do for these uh, neonatal maladjustment syndrome foals in the clinic if we think it's appropriate. Yeah. Um, recognizing colic in foals. Um, we'll not go through all sorts of colics, but recognizing colic looks a little bit different in foals than in adults. So they will not all roll, pull or um, be restless, but they can also lie like this in dorsal recumbency, especially if they have stomach pain. They can grind, uh, they may, can make a sound like grinding teeth. Um, they can be in sternal recumbency, as we said earlier, laying up upright. Tail flagging and wagging, um, also uh, something when falls, especially with meconium obstipation. Here you can see a fall. Uh, tail flagging um, can be a sign that there's something wrong, that it's got a bellyache, groaning and straining on the feces, all things that we um, would recognize as colic. And also here a foal lying with its legs tucked up, this is not a normal position and would yeah, give you a red flag to look at it. But there are a lot of causes of colic, of course, everything an adult horse Almost everything an adult horse can get uh, and develop colic from a uh, fall also can get uh, diarrhea really often um, gives colic in falls and we probably see the depression and colic and dehydration and fever even before there is diarrhea um, uh, coming out. Different, a lot of different causes, um, bacterial causes, but also a very often uh, uh, encountered a rotavirus, a viral infection, um, but also some protozoa. So there are a lot of different causes for diarrhea in foals. Um, what I always want to say uh, to owners, because we every year we get a few foals in the clinic that had diarrhea for a few days and the foal was actually drinking extra water also from a bucket or from the, uh, um, the water, the electric water in the stable. 
do not take the water bucket away because it's not the water bucket that is causing the colic. Um, if you take away the water bucket, the fall will dehydrate a lot faster and even get kidney failure, for instance. So we always give falls that have diarrhea when they're in the clinic, they get a water bucket to drink from and it will prevent very bad complications Yeah, or actually help to prevent. So all these uh, things, the failure of passive transfer will make a fall more at risk for developing um, uh, yeah, diarrhea and um, several sorts of colics, but mainly diarrhea, um, and delayed time to stand and nurse as well. But poor husbandry and poor nutrition and husbandry of your mare can also um, really induce um, yeah, hygiene problems and um, uh, yeah, diarrhea in your fall. Uh, I think this is the last one of the bladder rup uh, of the other causes of colic that I wanted to uh, tell about uh, the bladder rupture, um, something that also is enf encountered quite frequently in in falls. Um, uh, we think that it happens because the uh, fall is being born with a distended bladder, so a very very full bladder, and then because of the pressure during birth, it ruptures. It can also rupture after there's an inf uh, if there's like this picture an infection in the uh, in the umbilical, and then um, there's a like a weak spot in the bladder in the end, and it can also then rupture. If you see this, there's quite a lot of swelling here in the preputium of this fall. Uh, that's also a trigger to have a look at its bladder because edema around this area is not normal. Uh, this is a very young fall, it should look all tight. So symptoms, um, around an age of two, three, four days, um, they will stop drinking, get depressed and strain on urine as in the upper picture. They'll get a very distended abdomen and they start breathing really fast, they'll get colicky and you'll see either little or no urine. Um, sometimes they're able to, to urinate still if there's still some uh, urine in the bladder um, but most of the urine will go into its abdomen and it will just poison itself with uh, its own waste products and it will get very very sick um, only way of saving them is to do surgery uh, and to um, flush the abdomen and stitch up the uh, bladder here you can see um, an intraoperative picture of a, a bladder rupture and it needs of course to be closed um, I think this is almost, uh, or this is the, there's just two more diseases that I want to talk to you about. I hope uh, it's not getting too long in the meantime. <laughs> um, uh, this is, I think, a really important disease that not a lot of people know about. So I wanted to include it in this presentation. It's not a infectious disease, but it's uh, a preventable disease. And um, so I think we should try to do that. We see cases of these white muscle disease falls every year in the clinic um, and it's a form of a nutritional myopathy so uh, a muscle disease that's induced because of nutritional problems we mainly see it in very young foals after just being born up to a week old but it can also be uh, a disease of adult horses or older foals but like 85 percent of them is uh, a neonatal fall and they will present with muscle weakness with tremors with fasciculation so the muscles will it will uh, tremble they will uh, have difficulty to get up and to nurse at the mare they look depressed and because of their muscle weakness they will also be dysphagic so they will um, uh, swallow the milk not in the correct way and get it into their lungs etc and because they're not very well able to drink they will also develop or are at higher risk to develop failure of passive transfer and therefore also sepsis. Um, this is a, a, a muscle disease that is caused by m most often selenium uh, uptake problems, so a selenium shortage in the blood uh, of the mare. Uh, selenium uptake for the foal is mainly during pre pregnancy, so it acquires its selenium, uh, the mineral selenium, uh, through the placenta. And after it's being born, there's not a lot of uptake through colostrum or milk for the foal. So it needs to get its selenium store during pregnancy. And the vitamin E, it can almost only up take up uh, through colostrum. And selenium and vitamin E are very important antioxidants. And um, if you do not have enough selenium, um, your muscles are getting really big trouble and especially the muscles that use a lot of oxygen. Because in these muscles, um, free radicals accumulate and free radicals are harmful for the tissue that it's in, in this case the muscle. And if there are not enough antioxidants to grab those radicals and 
in this case these are these are selenium and uh, vitamin E um, you'll get muscle necrosis so the muscles start to die um, and a foal really is not able to get up and drink anymore and the nasty thing is that it's not just its skeletal muscles uh, but also its heart muscle that can be um, uh, damaged and I've put a fall of a sleeping fall there with arrows uh, to um, to point out which muscles are mostly affected so the masticatory muscles the heart muscle the diaphragm and the intercostal muscles so the muscles that assist with breathing and also the muscles in the hind legs to stand so if these muscles do not um, are not able to work anymore then yeah the fall dies and we know that this disease has a very high mortality. So around 30 to 45% of falls are reported to die from this disease when they have it. Um, if you do blood work, you of course see really high muscle enzymes. And if you measure selenium and or vitamin E, you probably measure one of them too low. Um, and well, the handy thing is that we can sort of predict, at least in the Netherlands, where, um, uh, where we have mares that will have foals that are at risk to develop this because especially sandy soil um, is low in selenium and if the soil is low in selenium the roughage that there that is locally produced on that soil will also be low um, but also if the mares just graze in that area they will not get enough selenium so um, i think i have a map on the next slide but um, it's very important to uh, to know about your selenium status. So you could check the blood of the mare and supplement the mare with organic selenium during pregnancy. But you have to think about this during pregnancy because afterwards uh, supplementing the mare, yeah, it's good for the mare herself, but not so much anymore for the foal. Um, this is a, a figure from a, a publication that we made a few years ago. And you can see the larger and uh, more black the dots on this figure. Um, the the better the selenium status in the ground is. And you can see all the yellow parts of the Netherlands are on sandy soil, and you can see really small dots. Um, and those are the areas where selenium is very low um, in, um, in the sandy soil. So there's not enough, sel enough selenium for the plants to absorb. Um, you can see the red dots, or it's a little bit slow, uh, small baby, but those are the areas where the cases from this uh, report uh, came from. So definitely from areas with low selenium. So if you are located in the Netherlands, or you can check when you're, if you're uh, from abroad um, in an area with low soil selenium, then or you've had previous cases with my white muscle disease, or if you've checked your um, mare's um, blood to for selenium content and it's too low, uh, then there's things you can do. Um, hey, you can uh, then have a look at your topsoil selenium levels. I would do that every four years, and you could try to influence that and to uh, promote more selenium in the ground. I'm not a, a real farmer, but... Um, there are some uh, helpful hints here on the slide to uh, increase selenium content in your soil and then therefore in your roughage um, by fertilizing it, sometimes even with selenium in the fertilizer or adding phosphate and alkalinizing the pH of your soil that could help in the long term. Um, Oral selenium supplementation of the dam, of course, during pregnancy and then after the fall has been born um, and we're still worried about its selenium content, we could give it an injection with selenium and vitamin E postpartum, for instance. So poor nutrition or husbandry, um, a lot of people are, I don't think aware of selenium content of their area, but I would really suggest to have a look at it because if they get it, they have a high risk of uh, dying and it's easily preventable. So the last uh, disease that I want to talk about is respiratory problems. And that's a really big uh, a cluster of things. But just a um, hint about a few things to think about when you have falls. Um, the aspiration pneumonia. So if you find that the, the birth was very heavy, uh, there was a dystocia or a really large fall, and there's meconium, for instance, in uh, and on the, on the fall, then you have to be aware that it can develop a pneumonia. So there's brown stuff coming out of its nose or on the fall, alert your vet. Yeah. And also with a neonatal maladjustment syndrome or for instance with white muscle disease, as we just talked about, um, the fall can um, accidentally aspirate milk because it's not strong enough to drink. And if it aspirates milk, it can develop a pneumonia. Yeah. 
rib fractures. Not a lot of people, I, I think at least not in the Netherlands, really think about rib fractures, but they happen quite often because of uh, uh, difficult uh, falling um, and if you get the vet out to check your fall for instance for its IgG level it would be very handy if you also had a look at the false ribs and in the upper pictures you can here see uh, an ultrasound image of a broken rib uh, with my finger pointing to where the rib was broken and often multiple ribs in a row are broken and you can imagine that that would give the fall um, a lot of pain and therefore um, less likely to get up and drink, so more at risk for other problems and infectious problems as well. Uh, if it's uh, uh, just like that, we would just let it heal um, with uh, rest, but if it's multiple uh, uh, ribs in a row that are fractured, um, you could uh, well think of uh, surgical intervention, especially when it's ribs really close to the heart. Um, bacterial pneumonia is very common. Um, uh, for the really young falls, because uh, this is a presentation about neonatal falls, I'm not really going into rhodococcus yet or uh, strangles. Um, on this picture in the middle, there's a Klebsiella pneumonia that was from a fall that was one day old. And that's just to give you a heads up about pneumonia. Uh, Klebsiella can live in the uterus as well and can give intrauterine infections and pneumonia. With um, uh, the viral pneumonias uh, going around in Europe at the moment, EHV 1 and 4, really important. Um, they can give abortions in mares, as we know, but they can also give really weak falls um, uh, after uh, birth. They can be born alive and have a very difficult first start. Um, when falls this young get EHV, uh, they often die from it. And the lowest picture is uh, a very young fall with strangles. Just be aware if you have strangles around with your falls, if they are really young and get it, it's very unfortunate because they get very dyspneic very fast and they need... Um, this one had a tracheotomy, for instance. So I think we've covered about all the risk factors um, uh, in this list uh, throughout the presentation and I hope everything has uh, been clear and that it will help you um, well with your next season of falls and um, I thank you for your attention and if you would have any questions you're very welcome to send me an email um, and then um, I hope uh, that everything goes well with the next falling season.